The first talk is by Judah Cohn, entitled The Relationship Between Recent Arctic Amplification and Extreme Mid-Latitude Weather. Judah is the Director of Seasonal Forecasting at AER, the Atmospheric Environmental Research, and a research affiliate at MIT's Parsons Lab. He works on the impacts of things like snow cover and soil moisture and sea ice on other climate parameters, and actually has, has enough nerve to provide seasonal forecasts based on these and other trends. He's also interested in the climate change aspect in decadal temperature changes and explaining them with large-scale climate models. When Judah was here at NASA, Judah noticed that there were patterns in weather for, for various winters, and he was not satisfied with the explanation that it was all just random variation. And so Judas decided to look into it and see if he could understand it better, and I think this talk is part of that process. I'll turn it over now to Judah. Judah, thanks for coming. Okay, um, just trying to, get, thank you, David. Is, um, what is it, how are you going? All right. Um, thanks for the very nice introduction. It's an honor to be part of this uh, webinar series and part of the book. And uh, obviously, all the <clears throat> uh, all the speakers here are, are, are a great tribute. You know, through the whole series, they're a great tribute to David Ryan and, and his legacy. So, um, in that spirit, I'll just start off by saying, if you enjoy the talk, I'm I'm very happy to share the credit with David Ryan. If you don't, it's all David Ryan's fault. So, uh, all right. Uh, so, uh, oh, jump right to the middle of the talk here. So, but uh, hope everybody can see my first, should be able to see my first slide. Um, what's going on? Am I opening the right talk? I think I op might open the wrong talk, actually. Sorry about that. We got two talks open. Or Dan, can you? Dan. Yeah, so yes. we're just going to make a quick announcement as Judah. It's okay. Started. Um, there'll <laughs> be some time for questions and answer at the end of each uh, presentation. If you do have questions, you can submit them to the chat window, and we'll review those um, after the talk. Okay. So um, yeah. So as David said, the talk I'm going to my my webinar is on the topic of the relationship between Arctic amplification and uh, mid latitude weather, including extreme weather. So over the past two decades or so. Robust warming has been observed for the spring, summer, and fall, but not in the winter time. And during this period, there's been um, amplified Arctic warming or accelerated Arctic warming. Um, Arctic sea ice has been melting and Eurasian fall snow cover has, has been increasing, which has been kind of a surprise even this past. It's not just limited to Eurasia, also North America had its most extensive fall snow cover this past uh, September, October, November. Um, uh, I'm not going to really argue it here, but um, I mean, most much of my research is focused on that fall snow cover in, in, um, and uh, extensive fall snow cover and a decrease in, in Arctic sea ice favors a weaker polar vortex. When the polar vortex is weak, high latitude blocking is more common, resulting in more severe weather, including cold air outbreaks and snowfalls across Europe, the eastern U.S., and East Asia. And if time permits, and I, I'll keep, try to keep it to about 30 minutes, I will uh, try to talk about the, the summer uh, you know, influence of, of Arctic amplification on extreme weather, which is somewhat different than what happens in winter, at least our thinking. So this, this upcoming winter is an El Nino uh, winter, and really El Nino, ENSO, has been the 800-pound gorilla, I would say, in, in, a, in seasonal prediction. I don't think anybody would really argue with me on that. And the thinking is that you have some kind of perturbation, let's say due to convection at, uh, along the equator and the, uh, you know, in the Pacific Ocean, and that then leads to this uh, propagation of Rossby waves. And this is an idea that's been around for a while, but it's, I would argue it's a um, two-dimensional type um, thinking or paradigm for seasonal forecasting and I think that is really what has dominated, you know, the discipline for the past three, four uh, decades or so. In my own work, I've tried to bring in the, the polar vortex into, into um, prediction of, of uh, unseasonal timescales. Here's a, an example, just trying to combine the impacts of uh, 
snow and ice, uh, where you have in the fall time changes, you know, in, let's say you have extensive snow cover, as I said in the, in the, in the introduction, and less sea ice, specifically in the Barents Kara Sea, that uh, produces a wave in the atmosphere uh, with ridging across northwest Eurasia and, and, and troughing in East Asia. So this, this wave pattern, which is, is a standing wave, a climatological wave, is amplified by these boundary forcings. When you have a more amplified wave, this increases the uh, EP, your lice and palm flux or vertical wave activity, but it's this energy transfer in, you know, in the vertical direction from the troposphere into the stratosphere, and then that tends to weaken the polar vortex. When you get a weaker polar vortex, you get warming over the Arctic, but you also get this uh, colder, colder weather, and the mid-latitudes is stronger across Siberia, but is often found in the eastern U.S. as well, and, 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 and over to the west here in Europe. So kind of uh, three-dimensionality uh, to this seasonal prediction problem. Okay, so just, you know, an animation of a strong and a weak polar vortex, this is in, you know, in the stratosphere, the contours show the geopotential heights and the, and the shading temperatures. But um, I, what happens in the stratosphere is, is kind of a, to first order, uh, is a nice illustration and maybe cleaner of what then will happen in the, in the troposphere. So it's, it's uh, but it shows up actually kind of cleaner, more cleanly in, in, the, in the stratosphere. So here's a, a winter, 1988, and you can see the polar vortex here is spinning around over the North Pole. The blues are the cold, cold temperatures are kind of confined within the polar vortex. And then these oranges and yellows are on the periphery. They're at lower latitudes, those are the milder temperatures. So you have this nice separation of cold to the north and warmer to the south. And that just goes on for weeks and weeks at a time. Uh, here's now an example of a weak polar vortex, and it's quite dramatically uh, different. So it starts out the same. You have a strong polar vortex. All the cold air is over the uh, Arctic region, but then you can see warm air is starting to come in multiple pulses, uh, invades the um, Arctic region. The polar vortex is, is broken into pieces, and the cold air that was uh, initially confined to the Arctic is spread out across the hemisphere at lower latitudes across the mid latitudes. So quite a, um, you know, quite a, I think, very dramatically different um, state of behavior between a strong vortex on the left and a weak vortex on the right. So now we're gonna, a lot of the talk is gonna involve polar cap height. Uh, polar cap height is the geopotential height anomaly average over every grid point from 60 north or 65 north to the North Pole. And I, and it's calculated from the surface through the stratosphere, mid, in the middle stratosphere, typically 10 millibars. And, but if that's a bit of an esoteric term for you, you could just think of the polar cap height as a proxy for temperature. Uh, certainly that is a, a good approximation uh, once you get away out of the boundary layer. So um, high polar cap heights are high temperatures or warm temperatures. I use red shading for that, and low polar cap heights are cold temperatures or blue shading. So I showed those two winter, uh, examples of winters, 1988-89, um, where you had a strong vortex, and that's on the right, the polar cap height, it goes from October 1st to the end of the winter, February 28th, and then, um, then there's the uh, other winter is the, where we had the weak polar vortex, 2009-10, and that's on the bottom. So you can see, that uh, was quite in, in the strong vortex uh, win, uh, winter. The Arctic was quite cold throughout. You can see this predominance of blue shading. So cold, cold, low polar cap heights, but uh, cold temperatures. And this is over the Arctic region, over the polar cap. And then in, um, in 2009-10, the, the weak vortex winter, we had um, a warm Arctic, the predominance of a warm Arctic. Uh, not only, so here the bottom of the plot is the surface and then the top is the, is the metro stratosphere. And not only is it warm in the bottom part of the Arctic, but it also extends into the stratosphere. And just these arrows here, just to show this, this the thinking is that there's this downward propagation, that these anomalies start it, with the polar vortex. What happens in the polar vortex then propagates down to the surface and you can see kind of this downward propagation on average takes about two weeks. Uh, and both the, with the strong vortex or the weak vortex, but admittedly, I think it's 
little more convincing here in the uh, in the weak vortex case. Okay, so now um, just that was kind of a lot of introductory material, you know, bringing in the polar vortex, why the polar vortex is you know is important to winter weather, but now bringing in the accelerated Arctic warming part. So, you know, just some background. We all know here's a global warming trend. We, you know, we're all aware that the globe is warming, except for maybe some regional spots but uh, it's warming everywhere. This is an annual trend and the warming is amplified or it's, you know, it's greatest across the Arctic region. And then the, it's more, you know, it's not as amplified, you know, it's more muted at, at the lower latitudes. And here on the bottom is a, uh, you know, kind of the interannual time series and you can see a very strong increasing trend, nothing new, new there. I'm sure everybody here is aware of that and it's not arguing against it. But also with the warm temperatures, the argument has been that warmer temperatures will lead to less snow. Uh, here's just some articles from the New York Times and some articles in the, in the scientific literature, even one very recently saying that, you know, with a warming globe, there'll be less snow. And I mean, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so, also, um, what's contributing to this accelerated Arctic warming? Uh, to, to first order scientists, you know, uh, Arctic scientists or climate scientists, um, you know, attributed to a decreasing cryosphere. That means less sea ice and less snow cover here. Um, plotted September sea ice in blue and, and, uh, and summer snow cover in red, uh, June snow cover. And so sea ice has gotten the most, most of the attention you know, from both the community and the media and the public, but um, this the decrease in snow cover has been as dramatic or possibly even more dramatic uh, in the spring and summer snow cover. Real, uh, really, uh, I think can be described as a collapse. And that is what I was thinking is why the Arctic warms faster um, than the other latitudes, um, because uh, there used to be a quite a high, much higher albedo reflectivity of the solar light coming, sunlight coming in at the high latitudes, and that's now disappearing. So much more energy is getting absorbed at the surface, leading to this amplified warming. As I showed before, you know, annual trends here is just isolating the winter trends. So going back to 1960, uh, you get the very similar picture. It's uh, warming everywhere, and you get this amplified warming in the Arctic region, in the high latitudes. Here's a, the temperature trend by latitude on the left side. So some, you know, weak or um, warming trends in the tropics and increases slightly and get to the mid-latitudes, but then really accelerates as you get to the higher latitudes. And if you look at the interannual time series, the um, Arctic is in red and um, the, the mid-latitudes in black. There's more variability with the Arctic, but uh, through most of the time, you know, the, the time this time period, the the trend, the, the warming trend, has been quite similar. Uh, really, when they were kind of um, on the same kind of trajectory. But then, starting around 1990, there was a very clear divergence in the two time series, where the Arctic is warming faster uh, or an amplified rate compared to the mid latitudes. And if you take the same do the winter temperature trend over that same period where there's just the you're limited to the Arctic uh, ex accelerated Arctic warming or the Arctic amplification, you get a very different looking uh, trend map. So now you get that really, really amplified, much more, now you see much more amplified Arctic warming. But now you get these this cooling, uh, cooling trends in winter across, especially across uh, Asia in Siberia but also extending it to Northern Europe and in the Eastern US. Uh, so hopefully these colors are not um, faded too much, but washed out, uh, but, it, uh, but I hope you can make that out. And if you look at the latitude temperature trend, so you get this weak warming trend in the, in the low latitudes in the tropics, subtropics, you have this really amplified warming, accelerated warming as you get to the higher latitudes towards the North Pole. And then you get this very surprising result, you actually get this cooling trend in the mid latitudes. So um, I've been spending my, quite a bit of my research focus. Is there a connection? You know, is it just something random or is there some dynamical connection between this amplified Arctic warming and the mid-latitude uh, cooling? And you know, despite the warmer world, I'd say it's, you know, it's come with lots of snow. Uh, uh, I've you know, mentioned that we like living in the Northeast, the golden age of, of snowstorms. So here's this Nessus 
uh, rating is from NOAA. They rate the snowstorm, northeast snowstorms, like they do hurricanes on a scale of one to five, the, those that are disruptive uh, to the population centers of the northeast. And it started going back to 1958, 59. And you can see we had, we averaged about six to eight per decade, never more than eight. Uh, of these storms, except for the most recent decade where we had actually 27, so a tripling, at least a tripling uh, of any previous decade of these really disruptive, impactful Northeast snowstorms. Okay, so I, you know, I'm gonna try to link this kind of increase, but we have this cooling trend and this increase in snowstorm and try to make the link between the Arctic amplification and, 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 this, um, and the polar vortex. So, Again, I showed that polar cap high plot for those two different winters, where if it's red, it's, it was much warmer over the Arctic, and then we had that weaker vor vortex. And I've kind of noticed that when the, really the, the Arctic region pulse, uh, like I refer to as pulsating red, you know, it's, it's amplified, really amplified warming, you get, you tend to get these extreme events in the, in the, across the mid-latitudes. Here's an example of the year 2012-13. Um, there was a weak, there was a, a, a weak polar vortex that, for that winter, it was a major midwinter warming here in January. But it started out, we had this um, strong Greenland block in, the, in October that, that helped direct sanding it towards the New Jersey and, and the New York City area. But there was an early nor'easter, and then there was these cold, snow, uh, and sn uh, cold snap snow in Asia, Europe. And then we uh, even had blizzard in the US. There was a very large blizzard here in, in Boston, um, extending into New York City area. I don't know if New York City got Nearly as much, but I think two to three feet across Long Island, Connecticut, and then eastern Massachusetts, more blizzards um, later in that winter, and even late, late into the winter. So quite quite an active year. It was an overall uh, warm Arctic. It was also the year we had the um, record low ice, sea ice minimum in September. So I thought that that was kind of a qualitative, you know, showing qualitative relationship. You know, the Arctic is warm you get more uh, extreme weather in the latitudes, and this is hemispheric in extent, it's not limited to just one region. I want to do something more quantitative, so looked at, uh, the you know, studied more carefully the polar cap, this relationship between polar cap high, which is a proc, or polar cap temperature, so Arctic temperatures, and extreme weather. And I did it for 12 representative, geographically representative cities throughout the U.S. Uh, was focused mostly on the northern cities because that's where you have most of the winter weather and the better statistics, but it's spread throughout. So I'm just going to show for a limited time to show for one for one city, Boston. Uh, maybe a little biased, but um, so we 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 looked at the relationship between severe winter weather and and polar cap temperatures or Arctic temperatures. And there was recently a couple of NOAA scientists came up with this index, the AWSSI, which is kind of like one, one index that just tried to represent the severity of the winter. It includes both snowfall and temperatures. So here uh, on this top plot shows all, uh, the, the relationship between, uh, shows the values, the value, the average value of the severity index. The higher the value, the more severe winter weather you have. Um, that's the shading. So, and it's, on the left side, on the x-axis is cold Arctic, and on the right side, uh, um, you know, or the of uh, the x-axis is warmer Arctic. So as you go, you can see as you go from a cold Arctic on the left side uh, to you know normal Arctic, average Arctic temperatures to warm and extreme warm Arctic, you go from blue shading, which means very low values or uh, infrequent severe winter weather, to you know more deeper deeper reds, which means increasing amount of severe winter weather and the relationship works both and this is from the surface um, you know into the mid stratosphere if you look at it within like the first week the, the relationship is stronger I, I don't think I'm going to show in this talk is stronger in the troposphere but as you go go longer and longer lead times it actually extends into the stratosphere uh, here's temperatures only so again uh, when the Arctic is cold, it tends to be warmer in the in Boston. When the Arctic is warm, it tends to be colder. So this um, inverse relationship is colder in Boston. And the same with snowfall. If the Arctic is cold, there's less snow in Boston. If the Arctic is warm, there's more snow in Boston. And I think this is quite, you know, I think representative of a lot of the north of all the northeastern cities. I'm just showing it for Boston. Here I showed it in more of a bar plot. Um, so the, the blues and the reds represent Arctic temperatures, and the greens represent this severe AWSSI uh, 
cumulative winter seasonal severity index, um, you know, so it is in the green. So you can see again where the, the Arctic is blue, especially uh, the Arctic is cold, right? Especially when the Arctic is cold, this you have the least amount of severe winter weather. And as the Arctic warms, the severity of, of winter weather in the Boston area um, increases and it's greatest when the Arctic is warmer. So it's really a big uh, jump in the value of, of the severity. This is taken at Blue Hill, and not so much as close here to Boston. It's actually the, lo uh, the, the longest observational record in the United States, continuous observational record in the United States. And for snowfall, we looked at the return period. Uh, we broke into two periods. It's pre-Arctic amplification, the green, and the post-Arctic amplification. I'm sorry, I got that reversed. The post-Arctic amplification is in the blue. Uh, the pre-Arctic amplification is in the blue, and the post is in the green. And so we looked at return period. So the lower the number means that that threshold of snowstorm returns more and more often. So let's say, you know, for an eight inch snowstorm, not much difference, but it looks like um, about almost, almost every, every one to two years. Um, and then as you get at the higher values, you can see there's this separation where the green, which is the post, you know, it's after, after during the period of Arctic amplification, it's about every three years, uh, where it used to be every six years, you know, about an 18, you know, or inch or greater snowstorm in the Boston area. So having of the return period. So, an, you know, 18 or inch or greater snowstorm is happening twice as often as it used to before Arctic amplification. And here showing um, kind of a daily trend index of both the shading is showing this polar cap height, so these Arctic temperatures, they, um, starting from December 1st through February 28th, the whole winter time. Uh, that's showing in, in, in the shading. Reds means a warmer Arctic, blue means a colder Arctic. Uh, and then this black line is the, the trend in the um, winter severity index. So, uh, through, you know, not surprising, the Arctic is warming. The tr warming trend is uh, great, is happening throughout the winter, but it's a greater statistical significance, which is the hatching, but also more amplified in the mid to late winter. Um, in the troposphere, actually, the, 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 I'm sorry, in the stratosphere, temperatures actually, there's a cooling trend at the beginning, and then you can see there's this, tra um, it, it, it tra trans transfers or kind of reverses, and you actually see a warming trend in the stratosphere as well, uh, similar to what you see in the troposphere from mid to late winter on. And this, as you know, as you hopefully, uh, kind of related it to a weaker polar vortex. So looking at the severity index in Boston, not much of a trend the first half of the winter, maybe a little bit more of a decreasing severe winter weather trend. But uh, once the warming in the Arctic is becomes both most more amplified in the troposphere and you involve the polar vortex where you get a weakening of the polar vortex, you can see that there's an increasing trend in severe winter weather. So kind of a tale of two, win you know, two parts of the winter, two halves, maybe a decreasing trend in the first half, and then this increasing trend in the second half. I would also add that um, based on just increasing greenhouse gases, we would expect the stratosphere to be cooling. Um, so this actually, and that's what the models were predicting. So this warming trend is, is, is a bit of a surprise, uh, actually but uh, I, I don't have time to really get into that. So, uh, and, and also the, this warmer, this weakening of the polar vortex itself should contribute to this amplifying of the warming in the, in the troposphere. So we had some uh, ni really nice example last winter. So here was a, kind of another animation from last winter. Um, this was in, we had, we had two disruptions of the polar vortex, but the bigger one was in February. You can see it was a split, uh, similar to what happened in winter 2009 and 10. So again, we had the, it's good, but you can see the signature of the very strong warming over the Arctic, and that cold air then gets displaced um, to lower latitudes. A piece went of it, piece of it went to Europe, another piece went into Canada and the Western U.S., and then eventually it actually made its way over to the Eastern U.S. as well. And um, also had a paper came out showed yesterday when you have a strong vortex, the temperature. Um, anomalies associated with that strong vortex it tends to be warm across Siberia, warm eastern U.S., cold over the Arctic. Um, 
this is for that week of that of, of event of a, uh, so a strong vortex and if you have a, a weak vortex the most the weakest of the vortices you get kind of the opposite temperature pat pattern you get a warm arctic they're cold northern eurasia especially over siberia extend to europe but you don't really get much of a signal in the eastern us but the, really the big signal that trumps out with a, a you know this weaker polar vortex is a cold siberia and the, but it tends to sense spread out from there uh, so that was here i broke it out by weeks so here was that week one kind of similar to what i showed and week two and three i just really want to bring your attention even though the the cold um with these events starts out in siberia about two weeks later you can see it really the, the, the really the most uh robust you know or at least statistically significant cold of highest the, high, the largest and negative anomalies are actually found across the u.s instead so this kind of migration or this cold spreads out from eurasia to the u.s so and again, um, you know, last winter we had a lot of snow, especially in new in the Northeast, when it, uh, certainly focused in, in, in New England uh, last last week. And um, again, consistent with what I've showed that an old warm Arctic favors these bigger snowfalls um, across the the Northeast and U.S. So we had that big, um, you know, so consistent with that, we had that big polar vortex disruption in February, and then we had the heavy snowfall that followed afterwards, you know, in, in the month of March. Here's, you know, temperatures, so, so, you know, Dave said I was brave to put out a forecast that could actually be verified in one's lifetime. Um, but here was the dynamical models on top. So this is a, the, the North American models on the left, top left. Here's the European models that also includes the CFS. But I mean, you can see quite a, a widespread prediction of warmth last winter, maybe one exception with parts of Canada. Here was the ob observations. Uh, you can see the Arctic warming is much more amplified than, than the models predicted, but you can see this, um, this cooling, this cold temperatures spread throughout um, the mid-latitudes of both Eurasia, Europe, and into, into the North America with the U.S. and the Canada. Here was our forecast that we issued uh, prior to the winter. So I think definitely a better match using our Arctic predictors. And again, not really part of this talk, but I, I, I do think being, using, uh, you know, it's important to try to, to, to use your ideas to make forecasts. And here, uh, I'd certainly say the, the model using Arctic predictors, not, not just relying on the tropics to make a seasonal vortex, did a much better job in, in, in both predicting the warm Arctic part, but also and the cold continents part of, of last winter, which was you know, basically missing in the dynamical models. Here was that, I showed that polar cap height again, with you could see, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you can see that that pulsating, where especially when you had that amplified warming in the mid to low troposphere, you tended to have last winter uh, the the really extreme weather. So for those of us in the Northeast, we remember the record cold in the East U.S. and the bomb cyclone, and then the four consecutive nor'easters uh, in March. Well, again, since it seems to be a uh, um, appropriate to talk about this winter, so here's a forecast. Just take it off from the latest GFS. Um, and you can see that signature of a polar vortex disruption of that strong warming over the Arctic. This, this one happens to be showing a polar vortex split. But anyway, but the important thing is that most of the models, not all, are showing a, a pretty significant polar vortex disruption uh, coming up. Um, there was actually just an article that came out today. Uh, polar vortex could unleash winter wildlife by January. So uh, trying to hype it. Everybody about the and here's here's that. I mean, this was this is a forecast. All, all these forecasts that I'm showing here are from made in November prior to the um, you know this obviously this is prediction of the polar vortex disruption. But again, here's our model uh, using the Arctic predictors, low sea ice, high snow cover, predicting you know a pattern somewhat similar to last year, a little different. Uh, there's also El, and so last year was La Nina, so it's El Nino, but uh, cold, especially in Siberia, really kind of. The, the character, you know, the, 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 the signature of a polar vortex disruption. Whereas these, again, similar to last winter, the dynamical models really showing this universal and, and, and you know, really widespread warmth, especially focused across the Eurasian continent. So I don't have, to, Summer will just take me one minute. I think I have a couple minutes left. I think I started about 10 after four. So normally we have a jet stream Right, you have a kind of a normal case, smooth temperature gradient, one jet stream, because you have this very nice gradient of warmth at the equator and cold at the, at the, at the pole. So basically one jet stream, and in the jet stream you have these weather systems, highs and low pressures moving along from west to east. 
but um, we have this disappearing snow and ice, like I showed in that early plot, right? But it's not um, in the summertime. Um, it's the heating. It, 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 okay, so we have uh, this disappearing snow and ice along a band um, around, near 70 North, right? Uh, the snow is on the northern uh, northern fringe of the continents. And then you have the ice disappearing. So that's where you get the strong, the most amplified warming. In the in the summer, the heating is actually um, is actually into the ocean. So the, the Arctic kind of actually remains some pretty cold in the summertime. But the really amplified warming tends not to be over, centered right over the North Pole, which is what we see in the winter time. It's shifted south along 70, more like 670, 70, 65 north. So you kind of have this two bands of gradients. You have it remains cold right over the over the Arctic Ocean because you still have, you know, because the heating is probably going from the atmosphere into the ocean. So any buildup of heat in the ocean is not ex ex escaping into the atmosphere. So the Arctic, uh, the Arctic, you know, the, the, the air above the Arctic Ocean remains cold in the summer, but you have the stronger, much stronger heating now uh, across the northern fringes of the continent. And that's where you have a strong gradient. And then if the temperature doesn't really change much along the, you know, from north to south along the gradients, at least initially, until you get closer to the subtropics and, and the equator, where again, you get another gradient. So you have these two, so you bifurcate the, this one smooth gradient into two, and you, you get these two or split jet streams. Um, and so one around 70 north, the other one more like 40 north. And when you have these two jet streams, you can get these, these weather systems that move along can get trapped and it's called um quasi stationary resonance uh i think this was some but qra i forget the exact terms so, um but you get so everything just moves very slowly and you get very strong persistence so you could have like so like uh, this past summer and i'll show the temperatures uh, you have high pressure can get stuck like it did over scandinavia this past summer and so you get this heat dome and and you get these heat waves hot and dry, um, and then, but also can work in the other way uh, where the troughs can also get stuck and you have this persistent uh, rainy events or if it's persistently dry droughts. And you can see kind of where these, this location of the heat domes here is again, like I showed these seasonal forecasts is the observed, but you can see there are these, where these heat, heat domes got stuck, one over Scandinavia, you, uh, one over uh, Central Asia and, the, uh, and Western North America, actually into the Northeast, you have this amplified warming, but you don't get the amplified warming now or right over the Arctic Ocean. So it's a very different type of amplified warming than, than what you see in the winter. So just um, in conclusion, uh, you know, I guess I worked on snow cover, David, uh, worked uh, with many things, but also including the stratosphere. Since leaving GIS, I've been working really to try to combine this study and the two, the relationship between, uh, you know, combining the snow cover, uh, specifically a Siberian snow cover in the stratosphere, but through the polar vortex, and then uh, trying to use that to understand and predict U.S., well, not just U.S. weather, right, but weather across the hemisphere, but obviously we're focused on the U.S., and which I would argue is kind of a you know new new paradigm. It's, you know, it's, it's turned, it turned a two-dimensional problem into a three-dimensional problem, and that's for understanding and predicting the the weather. Uh, the world is warming, but the Arctic is warming two or three times faster than the rest of the globe. And I would argue, and this is controversial, but I would argue that this warmer Arctic is resulting in more episodes of a weaker polar vortex or a polar vortex disruption. You know, I came to understand this through the, uh, studying snow cover. And severe winter weather is more frequent for extended periods following these PV disruptions. Um, so I would argue if you take the cumulative effect of both the climate change of, of a, a warmer world, but more, um, but more polar vortex disruptions, you get a shorter winter season, but often can be more intense. And we've seen quite a few examples of that, especially here in, in the northeastern US. And in summer, this, uh, the south was shifting now, it's hitting right, it's closer to the jet stream. It's not centered over the pole like it is in winter causes. It seems to cause the jet stream to split into two pieces, two, two, into two. And this uh, split jet stream traps weather systems uh, and so leads to more persistent or prolonged weather, whether it be heat, drought, or, or floods. So uh, thank you very much. So I think I'll, I guess I'll stop sharing. I don't know if anybody yeah. else can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please.
Tudor, thanks very much. Very coherent and convincing <laughs> presentation. Are you convinced? <laughs> I have a question for you. Uh, why do you think that climate models cannot get these predictions appropriate, appropriately? Since as you point out, forgetting about the dynamic seasonal forecast models, even the climate models themselves don't have a, a state in which they predict colder mid-latitudes, say over the Northeast, or in fact, increased uh, uh, stationary heat waves in summer. What is it about these models that prevent them from getting these sort of predictions? So again, I've tried to argue that the um, polar vortex has an important influence, um, or at least this whole kind of paradigm that I've you know, constructed for you in, involving the polar vortex, the, the, whether that follows a poor, whether, whether it be a, polar, a strengthened polar vortex or weakened polar, the models just don't get it. The, it is a well-known model bias that this downward propagation of the signal from the stratosphere to the troposphere stops at the tropopause and never makes it further. So if, as I'm arguing to you, for you, that, the, that this Arctic change is, is leading to this more severe winter weather through this polar vortex disruption, so in the observations, you can see the signal travel from the troposphere into the polar vortex and then down back to the troposphere. That, that chain of events gets kind of, it stops at the tropopause and never makes it down to the surface. So even if you, as so I actually had a paper came out today showing that even when the models were initialized with a polar vortex disruption, which they do, do have, you don't get cold weather, they still predict warm weather. Until that signal actually reaches the tropopause, the models are clue, seem to be pretty much clueless. And I think that's really the, the really big model um, er flaw or error that kind of um, decouples, you know, the Arctic from the mid-latitude and the models, uh, I would say, I would argue it decouples it incorrectly. Others would say that, no, that is correct. But I mean, I'm so, so you have, I just want everybody to be aware of that this is my opinion. Uh, not everybody's opinion and not everybody's accepted opinion. But I mean, it's a very known well bias that the models just don't propagate the signal back down to the, to the troposphere from the stratosphere. And, and the summer problem? Um, well, I think models just have a problem with blocking in general. Um, so uh, they, they break down blocking too soon. Uh, again, my, my, expert, I mean, my, my expertise, I would say, is really on the winter. But um, I think they, you know, the, again, we're still seeing widespread cold in the winter season. We really don't see it in the other seasons. So if you just kind of broad brushing it and saying, well, the model, you know, it's been getting warmer in the summer and the models are showing a generally warm pattern. They're not maybe getting the correct warm pattern, but they're, you know, it's only average. I mean, it's not a bad forecast. Um, the, the, I think the problem is more egregious in, in the winter because they're missing that whole cold that we're seeing, still seeing, you know, in the winter. I mean, maybe it'll eventually disappear, but at least we're, at least for now, we're still seeing it. So, um, uh, I would say, I would argue that the, there's definitely a problem, it's still a problem in the summer, but it's, it's I think, more egregious in the winter time. Thank there you. is no polar vortex, there is no polar vortex in the summer. So anything that I talk about the polar vortex is not applicable to the summer, summer, summer season. Thank you.